Good evening, friends. On behalf of Study Circle, we welcome you to the 44th meeting. And I now call upon Mr. Murthy to give introduction to the today's resource person. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the Study Circle, with pleasure, I invite Mr. Chitra Sampath, Senior Advocate, to its 44th meeting on the topic, Limitation Act, a glimpse. Though our speaker needs no formal introduction, as he is a very friendly senior advocate amongst the advocates and also a hardcore fighter in the court, it is our obligation to give some new introduction. Our speaker, after completing her BSc Honours in Chemistry in first class in university, of course, for our benefit, joined law in Ambedkar Law College, Pondicherry, and completed in in the year 1983, securing with first rank in both BGL as well as BL. Apart from that, she is also a recipient of Certificate of Merit in, in the Moot Court conducted by Bar Council of India, as well as recipient of second prize for the individual for performance in the All India Moot Court competition held in 1982-83. After enrolling as an advocate in the year 1983, our speaker started practicing law in the district court at Kadalur under Sri M. N. Krishnamurthy, advocate, and his son, Honorable Mr. Justice K. Kannan, where she had, she had practiced law in various fields of civil, civil laws and mostly into property law. And thereafter, in the year 1987, our speaker moved to Honorable High Court Madras and joined with the office of Sri R. Rajagopalan, senior at Senior Counsel and T.R. Raja Raman and has been appearing before the High Court in various fields of law. From 1998 onwards, our speaker has established independent office and designated as Senior Advocate in the year 2012 by our High Court. Our speaker is also a certified mediator and has been giving lectures in the Judicial Academy in Chennai the newly recruited subordinate judges. It is needless to say that today's session by the speaker is going to be an asset for all of us. And hence, without any further delay, I, on behalf, uh, on behalf of Study Circle, invite Mrs. Chitra Sambat, Senior Advocate, to enlighten us on the topic, Limitation Act, Aglimpses. Over to the speaker. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I'm most delighted to be among your miss. And uh, in fact, Corona has helped me to revise my legal acumen and these lectures have rejuvenated my uh, attitude towards uh, learning and sharing with my friends and my juniors. In fact, it's a pleasure to tell everybody what I have learned and only in that prospect, Lord, I, I have uh, come before this uh, study circle and the audience now present here to tell me what I have gathered in my years of practice. I'm not going to give you a lecture on what is Limitation Act because the audience here are very well aware about the Limitation Act, but I'm going to say what are the nuances which I have felt and which I have gathered in my years of practice, which may be of relevance to the practicing lawyers. And in these COVID times, without any limitation, I want to talk about the Limitation Act. In fact, what the Limitation Act says is, the doors of the courts are closed if you come with a delay, but your right is not barred. What does it mean by that? When a person is going to borrow money and he wants to recover it and there is some dispute or he refuses to pay, so naturally he comes and knocks at the doors of the courts. The courts are there to decide whether there was really a borrower or a with the discharge and then it will decide the issue. The limitation hack has brought in some restrictions in time limit for the litigant to approach the court. But it is without saying the litigant will never know when he will get justice. Limitation Act provides time limit for the litigant to get justice or approach the court. But once he has approached the court, he is at a loss to know when he will get the remedy for which he has approached the court. That is present today's uh, docket explosion. We have to say it with a sad heart. 
and now with the corona times it's in fact the backlog is increasing day by day in fact i take this opportunity to ask all the lawyers to cooperate for at least final disposals in do through video conferencing so that let there not be further delay in the disposal of the cases with this prelude i would like to share my powerpoint presentation so that i can take you through the limitation act i don't want to go through the limitation act section wise but i have compartmentalized it and i am going to concentrate only on certain relevant provisions with the case laws i think that itself will be quite time consuming so i am not going to take each and every section and analyze it but i'll give you a broad perspective on what we have to find in the limitation act now the limitation act what we have before is an act which applies only for initiation and continuation of proceedings before a court constituted under the constitution like the magistrate courts small causes courts a high court municipal court sub court district court only that it will not apply to any other special courts or tribunals or quasi judicial authorities or administrative bodies this you can see by a reading of section 4 of the limitation act it says section 3 says subject to the provisions contained in sections 4 to 24 inclusive every suit instituted appeal preferred and application made after the prescribed period shall be dismissed although limitation has not been set up as a defense so if you see the uh, methodology which has been adopted and uh, what is said in the entire sections including the schedule it will be seen that it speaks about the suits applications appeals and uh, petitions filed before a court not before any other forum that is the reason why there has been uh, decisions which i which i have quoted as 2015 7 scc 58 and 2019 7 acc 108 in this 58 case though it this will be covered even the subsequent uh, provisions these two cases where the question was whether the limitation can be invoked when there is no such exclusion specifically or when there it will be specifically mentioned to a particular section the court has said as a matter of uh, the what is said in the limitation act you cannot import limitation act into all other enactments or any special enactments where certain remedies are being contemplated only if it is specifically mentioned in those statutes or those tribunals will be governed by the limitation act you can invoke it therefore if now you see what is the schedule schedule runs into several parts if you see it speaks about suits relating to accounts suits relating to contracts suits relating to this the suit relating to immovable property suits relating to so whatever is said is only relating to suits and then a further appeal and then an application therefore the application of the act we have to make a note that we are talking about the limitation act as applicable to the suits appeals and applications that are filed for the court alone now there is a time limit which is fixed under this schedule various articles which runs from 1 to 137 each gives us when the cause of action arises within what time you have to file a suit or an appeal it is not possible in all cases to approach the court within a particular time frame there may be some exigencies so the legislature thought that we will give them some lever and certain aspects of uh, inconvenience or uh, a disability can be condoned for extension of the period of limitation therefore period of limitation means the time which has been specifically mentioned in the articles which is the schedule to the limitation act now under sections 4 to 14 24 various provisions have been in incorporated to say that in what circumstances you can get an extended period of limitation so if you are going to compute on the basis of those sections and add that to the article uh, the limitation prescribed in the article it is called as prescribed period 
So what is contemplated is I have to file a suit within the prescribed period. The period of limitation is in the article. When I invoke the article, I may be out of time. But however, in view of the various provisions which enables me to exclude certain time and uh, add it to my uh, period of limitation, it becomes the prescribed period. Now we will take what are all the exceptions or extensions which are being contemplated under the Act. The first one is the legal disability. As a plaintiff, I come to court. What are the legal disabilities recognized under the Limitation Act is only two, which is three, minor, minority, insanity, and if I'm idiot, if I'm idiot. So big, why? Because a minor cannot approach the court, you all know, he can be represented by a guardian. But the guardian doesn't act. Even there have been cases where a guardian files a suit and it gets dismissed for default. Even in such cases, when the minor attains majority, he can file a fresh suit. There will be no question of order to rule to bar. Therefore, a minority gives a person an extended period of limitation. When a person is insane or an idiot who cannot take care of, once the insanity ceases or an idiot ceases, this, the question of limitation will arise. Only after that, not before that. For this, there is an exception under Section 80. What is the exception is, it says, nothing in Section 6 or Section 7, that is Section 6 is legal disability, will apply in cases for enforcing the rights of preemption. So, a minority or insanity or this will not apply if, the, if it is going to be a right of preemption. I, the reason why the right of preemption has been specifically excluded is, it is a right which a person has to exercise when another person is denying him or he is having an exclusive right to buy a property or exclusive right to get a something. So, this particular is, which is, which is timed bound, therefore, minor insanity or the CDSC will not give him an extended period of limitation for a right of preemption. So, okay. so a person who is coming to court, he is not mentally all right or he is a minor. Therefore, he is recognized to come to court with a delay and that is computed under Section 7 to be excluded from the period of limitation prescribed into the article. The next disability is, I am not able to file a suit directly. I have to file an application for leave to sue. Only then my suit can be taken on file. Suppose I don't have the money, so I file it as a suit as a pauper. So a pauper application has to precede even the numbering of the suit. Then section 92 CPC, where they have to obtain a leave. Of course, for 92 CPC, there's no limitation, but I'm only saying where there has been a contemplation of leave. In the High Court original site, we have to file an application for leave to file the suit. There have been cases where parties have approached the court with an initial application under Order 1 too late in the earlier years. But now today, the suits are numbered along with the application under Order 1 too late in view of the judicial precedent. So leave to sue under Order 1 too late is not a condition precedent for numbering the suit because once the suit is taken on file, the Order 1 too late representative capacity, if it is allowed, the suit will be preceded as a representative character. If the application is dismissed, the suit will continue only in its individual capacity. Therefore, it doesn't proceed. So, that, that I'm only saying is when a person has to approach the court with the leave and he files an application for grant of leave, then the period till he gets the permission to enter the court with, an, with his claim, that period is excluded under the section 7. Section uh, 7. Six itself. Next, is section 7, which speaks about where there are several disability of several persons and when the limitation will start. Normally, these things happen in case of Hindu undivided family, where there is a copartsonary interest, there is an alienation. There may be many minor copartsmas. If, if the first the copartsman who is the eldest, the moment he attains majority, he has to challenge it. If he fails to do it, later he joins along with the other minor co partners then his right will be, his right, will be barred by limitation. So the legal disability, which the disability of one of several persons, this legal disability of one person will affect the others 
if all of them have to sail together and if one is he come, comes out of a legal disability if he can represent the interests of the others then the limitation will start running if he cannot represent the others then he only co him the limitation will run and not in respect of the other persons so when i was practicing when there are various minors who have to challenge the alienation and though they may be together, what we do is the persons who are major co-pastors who have not challenged the alienation will be shown as dependents. And we'll take only the two minor co-pastors who will be challenging the alienation as a plaintiff. This is how we always circumvent the law. So everybody knows it. The next one where we're having an extension of limitation is where we go before a wrong forum. Sometimes we go before a consumer court and we fight it out up to the National Tribunal and even go to the Supreme Court. See the question whether you are a consumer, whether your consumer is a dispute which can be decided by the consumer forum becomes a contentious issue. And ultimately the court decides against the claimant. Naturally, then he has to come for the civil suit. So the time he has spent in the consumer court will be added to the period of limitation which is prescribed under the article to enable him to maintain the suit on that is called under section 14 when I have been diligently and with bona fide prosecuting in another forum. So for which I have given some case laws, we'll take some of them. 2008-7 is CC-169. In 2008-7 is CC-169, the Supreme Court has laid on in what context we have to see, we are not entered, the plaintiff is not entitled to exclude the period which he has spent in the earlier litigation as a matter of fact. He has to show due diligence and he was bona fide prosecuting it. So what do you mean by bona fides and what do you mean by due diligence that he was prosecuting has been laid down in 2008, 7 SCC, page 169. So I, you can refer to that. Next in 2009, 1 SCC, page 786. That was a case a writ petition was filed. And in fact, he was asking for demand of certain money and uh, certain issues were raised. The court said, on certain issues, the writ petition was disposed of in favor of the petitioner. But in so far as the recovery of the amount was concerned, it was said that writ is not maintainable. So even though the writ was not entirely dismissed or allowed in his favor, in so far as his claim which was made for money in the writ petition is concerned, he was allowed to use this section 14 for extension of period when he went back to file a suit after the disposal of the writ petition. So normally what we will do is in the earlier proceeding it should have been there should have been a finding saying that person that is not made tenable or the matter should have been returned to us saying this court has no jurisdiction I was prosecuting before that is how we have always understood section 14 and we will say that it is a wrong forum but here is an case where this it was not dismissed on the ground of a wrong forum certain reliefs were given but certain reliefs were said it is not available before him in a written jurisdiction. In those circumstances also, the courts have said he is entitled to Section 14 because it has to be decided along with the other issues. The court cannot adjudicate that factual issue. Therefore, he was decided, allowed to go and he was bona fide prosecuting before the court. And then in 2014, 1 ACC, page 648, there was a case where a suit was filed. The matter went up to the appeal and all that. And then it was uh, directed the plain, the court had no jurisdiction. It has to be presented before another court. So the plaint was asked to be returned. So the plaint was again represented before another court. Normally when a plaint is returned, it will be given an endorsement will be made on the plaint by the returning court saying that you present it within one month before the next court. Sometimes you don't present it within the next time, you go with a delay in representation and that is taken on file. So they, the court said, now what will be the limitation? For the second suit, whether can I say that the plaint was filed only on the day when he represented it in the second court or whether I'm entitled to take note of the earlier litigation where I was prosecuting for the wrong forum. The court said the second suit, though it may be a fresh suit as far as the plaintiff is concerned, in so far as computation of limitation and for the court piece is concerned, we will take into account the earlier proceeding which has been pending, which was for which he has been prosecuting diligently and he took back the papers. That has to be excluded under section 14 of the Act. So, this is a very interesting point where we have to take note of saying that earlier proceedings, how and when we can seek extension for uh, computing the period of limitation for the next proceeding. 
Now, one say other circumstances uh, which usually comes is one of the party goes to court. He obtains an order of injunction. Or he gets an order of stay. Suppose even I'm going to go and uh, seek recovery or some uh, recovery matter or revenue matter. I go file a writ petition. There is an order of stay. In what circumstances? Uh, but I have a remedy again for filing a suit. But I keep quiet, saying that this is an order of stay, this is an order of injunction. Therefore, I may be entitled to extend the period of limitation. No. Not in all cases of orders of stay or injunction, you'll be entitled to an extended period of limitation. Only when that order and injunction prevents you from exercising your right to file a suit, only then you'll be entitled to an extension of period of limitation. Not otherwise. Suppose I was plaintiff files a suit for, uh, say, for declaration of title and uh, injunction. You know that fellow, uh, that plaintiff is in possession of the property. And you have to file a suit for recovery of possession. But you fight the entire litigation. You wait for the suit to be dismissed. But you know by now that the minimum take more than 12 years to, for the entire proceeding, even the second round of litigation to come to an end. What will happen if the, after the disposal of the suit, dismissal of the suit in the second appellate stage after about 20, 25 years, can the defendant go and file a suit for possession? No. Once the plaintiff has come to court and asserted, I am asserting my title, the decision, the adverse position runs. So the defendant has to be diligent to file immediately a suit for recovery of possession or file it by way of a counterclaim in the same suit so that you can have the Tamil Sodramari or Kalla Rindamangadi. Now, that is where the, the, the stay order or injunction, half of us, what we think is, Oh, let the plaintiff's uh, right title be decided. Then I'll go, after the decision, I'll go and file a suit. No. There's no bar against the defendant from approaching the court to redress his grievances. Upon them, normally what they do is, they file a suit. Since the proceedings are pending, we'll file an application under Section 10 of CPC, stay the proceedings till the disposal of the earlier round of litigation. That would be the better advice to a client, rather than wait for the first proceeding to go because the possession becomes adverse to the defendant and you lose his right in the property. So, please make note of it under Section 15 of the Limitation Act. Next is about the death and before the expiry of the period of limitation that is provided. Suppose I have a right to go to the court, but before I exercise my right, I die. My legal heirs will be entitled to the entire period of limitation from the date of my death or, it is, or when the legal representatives become identified. Suppose there is no issues at all then there's an executor appointed or there's going to be an administrator appointed. So once the estate gets vested and a person who can represent the estate is identified, the limitation will start running only from that day. Normally what we will think, yes, there were three year period of limitation. The man was living for two years. So balance was only one year. So that one year alone will be available to the legal representative. No, if you read section 16, which is very interesting. Section 16 says the entire period of limitation will be available to the legal representatives if the person on whose behalf or from whom they have inherited I was not able to exercise his right under the for in respect of the property or by maintenance so during the period of limitation available to him and he dies before the exercising that right. So the entire period becomes available to him. So don't think that you can deduct two years and balance one year alone is available. So that you may kindly note that tricky word in section 16. Is very interesting. I'll just read that portion. Where, if you see for clause one, where a person who would, if he were living, have a right to institute a suit or make an application, dies before the right accrues, or where a right to institute a suit or make an application accrues only on the death of a person. The period of limitation shall be computed from the time when there is a legal representative of the deceased capable of instituting such suit or making such application. Where a person against whom, if he were living, a right to institute a suit or make an application would have accrued dies before the right accrues, or where a right to institute a suit or make an application against any person accrues on the death of such person, the period of limitation shall be computed from the time when there is a legal representative of the deceased against whom the plaintiff may institute such suit or make such application. Nothing in one and two applies to suits 
to enforce rights of preemption or to suits for the possession of the immovable property or of a hereditary office. This is what is very interesting because suppose the adverse possession I was speaking, the defendant or the plaintiff who has to file a suit. Once that the adverse possession starts, even if he does not come to court within the time limited by law, it continues to run and it will, it will not be uh, it will continue to be added even to the uh, legal representatives uh, this whereas all other causes of action even though he may have entitled to that he, the legal representative will have an additional uh, cause of action that is period of limitation for coming to the court except these three types of suits that is for possession of immobile property preemption suits or hereditary office in all other the legal representative will be entitled to the entire period of limitation Please kindly make note of that. Next is section 17, which speaks about fraud or mistake. Now, in fact, one of my friends was asking that uh, somebody has uh, uh, represented him and uh, by impersonation had uh, registered a sale deed. What will happen? In fact, I have. Uh, Category. I have another slide on void and voidable transactions. I'll take you in detail. So fraud or mistake is where you are aware about the existence of that fraud or mistake. Then you have to come to court within three years. That is what it says. Fraud or mistake will give you a particular time limit. So from the day you will come to know about the fraud or mistake, you have to come. If you see effect of fraud or mistake, section 17, where in the case of any suit or application with your limitation is prescribed, the suit is based upon the fraud of the defendant or a respondent or his agent. The knowledge of the right title on which suit or application is founded is concealed by the fraud of any such person as aforesaid. Or the suit or application is for relief from the consequences of a mistake. Or where any document necessary to establish the right of the plaintiff of obligation has been fraudulently concealed from him. The period of limitation shall not begin to run until the plaintiff or applicant has discovered the fraud or mistake. This is not with reference to void or voidable transaction. This speaks about the existence of fraud or mistake in the course of the proceedings. I have a right, but I do not know about it. Because of the concealment of a certain fact, I'm not, I'm not, it has not been revealed to me. Therefore, I get an extended period of limitation. So section 17 does not speak about void or voidable transactions. It comes under a separate head. Next, coming to acknowledgement in writing. The 18 and 19 are very interesting topics which will also be treated as an admission under section 18 and uh, 17 and 18 of the evidence act you have to read both so what is an admission in pleading admission in letters admission in so and so it is also similar to an acknowledgement writing yes there is an admission of a liability so it is called as an acknowledgement in writing and rating i make a payment towards a particular debt then it is a payment it's an acknowledgement by section 19 but the payment towards should be towards a debt. It's just not, not any payment. It, you have to mention in the payment that it is towards this. Therefore, there are going to be some payment. There are uh, mutual transactions might have been there. So I make some payment. He makes the payment. And there have been several invoices exchanged between the parties. So if you're going to show it as a running account, then it will go towards the earliest bill. If it's going to be going to the uh, particular bill, you can specifically mention about that. So a payment should be towards a particular debt and that will treat it as an acknowledgement for that particular debt. So there have been cases where when I was doing a trial, there has been several uh, sale of uh, wood line where there have been several invoices which has been given and uh, the defendant had been making certain payments. The plaintiff what he used to do is and the payments were made for the invoice amounts, specific invoice amounts were given. It was not given as though or 20,000 or an ad hoc payment was never given. He always made payments towards the specific invoice amounts. But what the plaintiff did was, he was giving an adjustment to very old matter, old invoices also. So the question arose whether there was an acknowledgement of debt of the earlier ones by these payments. So we have to look into the letter of the defendant to see that this payment is made towards which debt. If the payment is to be made toward a particular invoice, it can be only for that debt. It cannot be given credit for an earlier debt. Therefore, payment towards a debt will amount to an acknowledgement. And an acknowledgement in writing in section 18 means the creditor acknowledges, yes, I owe so much of money. We have always been thinking about acknowledgement 
only in from the uh, view perspective of a uh, data can a creditor acknowledge a debt that was a very interesting question when i had joined the bar and i appeared before uh, his lordship the ss subramani ji a second appeal had come I, that was somewhere in i don't know 91 92 and uh, in the second appeal there was no respondent so only i had uh, appeared and uh, the court said and i was a mortgage owner and i was trying to seek redemption of the mortgage and he was pleading the mortgage he was pleading uh, limitation then his lawyer said you go and get a case law which says that that can be an acknowledgement by a creditor also and uh, for that i had to work out and uh, of course uh, ultimately i got a judgment but today but now other so where uh, earlier now we have a direct case law on that that is 2006 4acc 484 where the creditor that is a mortgagee assigns the mortgage in favor of a third person and in that document he specifically says that there is an existing mortgage between him and that uh, particular person that is a mortgagee so much of amount is due that i have been assigned that debt to you you can go and recover if he mentions all that in the contents of the document assignment deed then there is an acknowledgement of a liability acknowledgement of the existing that creditor debtor relationship which gives rise to the uh, new period of limitation for the debtor see that is very important why we, we we very rarely come across such cases where now normally we can see that in the company laws also where the balance sheet will be reflecting the uh, various amounts payable to a particular company or the uh, the assets and liabilities uh, columns will also say indicate so much of amount is due that is treated as an acknowledgement between uh, various uh, parties but but is always only in the case of uh, debtors what about the creditors so creditors normally we don't take uh, much uh, view because it is self serving therefore i don't want to look into the acknowledgement by the creditor he can write now a company can say so much is due from chitra sampath and he'll write 10 lakhs but that doesn't mean that they have to be under there is a creditor debtor relationship but in these cases where there is a mortgage mortgage or relationship where there is an assignment suppose the mortgage is executed as sale what he says is this is the amount that is uh, available under the mortgage and i'm going to sell the uh, i'm selling the property you recover it from him that is all he says he says there is an existing mortgage or he doesn't say anything he simply says so much of amount and he sells it and he says it is subject to a mortgage you recover it from it that will not amount to therefore 2006 for ssc specifically explains what will amount to an acknowledgement of a debtor creditor relationship in a particular document so you please kindly read those uh, that judgment it will be enlightening to all of you now coming to sections 5 14 and 29 do i want to put it together because all case laws are all uh, are consolidated and all of them have answered all the three i thought i'll just uh, add of them add all the three of them together and uh, place it before you section 5 applies to only for filing of applications and appeal one of the jury members of the bar have asked me why it shall not be applied to suits no the period of limitation of the article of suits cannot be condoned under section 5 now you read section 5 for a moment it speaks about extension of period in certain cases any appeal or any application other than an application under the provisions of order 21 of the code of civil procedure may be admitted after the prescribed period if the appellant or the applicant satisfies the court that he had sufficient cause for not preparing the appeal or making the application within such period it doesn't speak about suit whereas if you can see section 3 it speaks about all suit instituted appeal preferred application made is mentioned in section 3 but when it comes to section 5 it speaks only about filing of the appeal and the application therefore section 5 cannot be invoked for extending the period of limitation for filing a suit suppose i want to file a suit on a promissory note it is 3 years from the date it, the amount becomes due i cannot get an extension under section 5 suppose i have to file a suit for recovery of possession of property it is about 12 years 
I cannot get an extended and uh, section five. So section five will have no application for institution of the original suit. It will be applied only for filing an appeal or the application. So please note that section five will not apply. Now coming to application of section five. 14 in respect of various other enactments i have already said that limitation act will apply only to courts not to quasi tribunals or to any other uh, uh, quasi judicial authority or administrative positions we have now come across various cases under the rent control act family courts act arbitration conciliation act land acquisition act surface act Revenue recovery, uh, recovery of debts due to bank. Back. So we have several enactments which have provided for a separate hierarchy of uh, tribunals and they have their own uh, uh, appellate authorities and providing for the time of uh, period of limitation for exercising their rights under those acts. The questions arose was whether section 5 can be applied to them. The courts have said no. You cannot apply Section 5 there unless it has been specifically mentioned there. The Limitation Act will be, we have to be made to be applied there. Whereas when you come from there to the High Court, once you enter the High Court corridor by way of an appeal provision or a revision provision given under those acts, when you come to the court, then all these Section 5 will come into play. Whereas before the tribunal, before the quasi-judicial authority, you have no right to invoke Section 5 unless it is specifically provided. So the question of specific exclusion of limitation act is being spoken under section 29.2. So originally everybody said there should be a specific clause which says limitation act will not apply to any proceedings here. That was what we all thought that it should be there. Then the courts, the judicial presidents have come up and it said if we are able to gather from the hierarchy, from the way in which the provisions have been taken, that there is a specific or implied exclusion of the applicability of the act and its provisions, then it is excluded. For example, in the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, for filing an application to set aside an arbitration award under Section 34, we have a period of limitation in the first claim, say 90 days, three months. And it will have a proviso which says, not thereafter, that is, there will be an extended period of 60 days. And not, or it means 60 days and then 30 days, I stand corrected, then not thereafter. So the word not thereafter in the proviso, in the section 34 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act, was taken note of by the courts to say that it means that section 5 cannot be invoked. I have, they have themselves, legislature themselves has limited the time within which the court can extend a particular time frame to exercise that right. So you cannot bring in section 5. So section 34 has to be filed within the particular time. Similarly, in Family Codes Act, the Rent Control Act, there has been specific time limit and further extension has been granted. So, Land Acquisition Act, Surface Act. For these, I have given you some case laws. Let's just, I'll rush through some of them. Yes, this 2015-7 SCC, page 58. This is speaking about the act under the uh, Central Excise Act. What happened was in that case, and uh, an appeal was filed before uh, CIGAT and then the matter went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said the appellate authority is uh, Commissioner Appeals, you have wrongly prosecuted. So they uh, directed him to file the appeal before the Commissioner Appeals. So he goes before the Commissioner Appeals, it is dismissed on the ground of delay and then the matter goes back. So the court said that we invoke the principles of section 14 and then we'll apply. So even though the Limitation Act was not applicable to the particular uh, proceedings, the court said the principles of Section 14, that is prosecuting in a wrong forum, can be applied in the particular case. And then he was entitled to maintain the second round of litigation. And he was allowed, the appeal was allowed to be entertained. And then the further orders were passed. Next is we have this 2019 7SCC. And this is a case before the HRNC commissioner. And the concerned person did not exercise his right within the time, but he filed an application to condone the delay before the commissioner. That was found to be not maintainable because even though he may be deciding it in a quasi judicial way, Section 5 of Limitation Act will have no obligation. Therefore, that was rejected. So the court said the Section 5 will not apply to the commissioner of the HRNZ Act. Then we have this 2000, 2017 2 ACC. 
in this was a case under the VAT Act, and the court, after uh, discussing the facts, said that Section 5 of the limitation was excluded because there's a special mention in that particular act that Section 4 and Section 12 of Limitation Act alone will apply. So the fact that Section 4 and 12 alone is mentioned impliedly means all other sections are not applicable. Therefore, Section 5 cannot be applied is what the court said in 2017 to ACC. Then we have this 2016 1 ACC 444, which speaks about the application of Section 5 under the surface and the revenue recovery of debt due to bank. The court held that Section 5 does not apply. But the principles of Section 14 are agitating in the wrong forum will apply even under these acts. And the court has condoned the delay by reading uh, Revenue Act into Surface the Act, and they have condoned the delay in the uh, appeal which was filed for the court. And uh, 2008 SCC is what is Section 34, which I have just spoken about a few minutes back. Under the Arbitration Conciliation Act, the word not thereafter has been interpreted in that section, in that particular judgment. Now, in 2019, 9 ACC 435, what happened was uh, an application in the section 34 was filed before a court. Then it was uh, argued by the respondent that that court had no jurisdiction and therefore 34 has to be filed before another court. So, the, my, the, he, it has to be returned and it has to be presented before the appropriate forum. So, the court, well, they, with the new court, the, uh, the new forum before which the matter was uh, filed, it cannot be filed as a, a fresh court because I suppose it is going to be in the Madras High Court. Now, I go and file it in the Trivandrum District Court. I cannot use the same format. So, uh, when I file, it was appearing, appeared to be barred under law because it will be definitely outside the time. Then the court said, Sex principles of Section 14, can be invoked even in these cases, even though specifically Arbitration Act, that is the Limitation Act, has not been made applicable to the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. The court excluded the time to entertain Section 34, which was presented before a wrong forum and then represented before a proper forum. And in 2016, 3 SEC 468, it was a matter arising under the Election Commission. There is no specific exclusion in those uh, uh, provisions. And the Supreme Court says, once the election commission decides uh, the rights of parties, disputes, arbitrates, and uh, discharges judicial functions, then all the parameters of Limitation Act can be invoked and it will be applied to those cases also. Then in 2009, 1 SCC page 786, And I think it is a repeated one which has already been there in the earlier proceeding. So I just skip that. So what I can conclude from in this particular uh, uh, aspect is wrong forum, how we have conducted yourself. Then there is an exclusion of limitation in what circumstances. And when you are coming to the court, then you will be bound by the limitation act. Now, I have dealt with the specific exclusions which have been uh, highlighted in the Limitation Act. Now, the one which uh, procedurally I would like to explain certain difficulties which we lawyers face with reference to the application of certified copies of the judgment and decree. Inspection first specifically postulates that, these, that once I have a right to appeal, period of limitation, I am entitled to deduct the period for the obtaining of certified copies of the judgment. So we can exclude the date of judgment. Then we can exclude the date of filing of copy application. We can exclude the date of receipt of the application. So the balance days has to be computed. So the uh, if it is happens to be a, a holiday, we can file it the next day. What we used to do as a trial lawyer was, I am entitled to 90 days to come to the High Court. Date of judgment is 1-1-2020. I file the copy application on 2-1-2020. So no loss of time. The judgment copy alone I will apply. I will not apply for decree copy. Because decree copy will never be made ready immediately. So when the judgment copy is called for, say it is called for on 
five seven or uh, five four. Once the judgment copy is called for, I file an application for decree copy. So five four, I'll be filing a, before I could get the judgment copy. I get the uh, I file the application for the decree copy. But when you see separately, the decree copy would have been applied for only after the period of ninety days. But still, what happens is, since the judgment copy I have not received, and I have filed the decree copy within uh, the time I got the judgment copy, I get the judgment copy. Wait for the decree copy to be read. So I was talking about the combined calculation which we have adopted during my trial work, uh, trial uh, law as a trial lawyer. That uh, you have a, a calculation where you can add the judgment and decree, even though decree might have been obtained at a later point of time, provided the decree and the judgment are obtained even before the other one is made ready. Now uh, the how to compute the period of limitation? The Supreme Court has also said what dates can be excluded. The date of judgment, the date, uh, the when you made the application. Those judgments you can refer as 2010, 12 ACC, page 210, and 2003, 9 ACC, page 393. In fact, 2010, 12 ACC, page 210 is the date of judgment to be excluded, and these principles are applicable even to arbitration and conciliation act for setting aside an award. Suppose I don't have a copy of the award, I make an application to the arbitrator. And he takes some time to send it. So my right to file the uh, award, will, though I have a knowledge of the award, till I get a copy of the award, I my time will I can entitle to exclude time and then file the uh, application under Section 34. In 2003, 9 ACC 393, an interesting uh, case law which I saw was all along I have been thinking. Suppose I have 90 days time to file an appeal. As I said, one one one, I file an uh, the judgment is there. Two one, I have filed a copy application. Suppose I don't file the copy application on the next day. Suppose I file it with a delay of five days. What we will do? We will deduct those five days in between the date of judgment and the date of copy application while computing the period of limitation. That will be always uh, taken into that you come with a delay, and we will usually compute. So normally in our high court registry, what they used to do is, suppose I have filed the copy application itself only after the period of limitation, that is on 90th day, 91st day. The time spent for getting the copy will never be added to the this and they will add it to our condone delay petition and say that the entire uh, period from the day one till I file the appeal will be treated as a period of limitation. But that is wrong. What the Supreme Court says here is in 2003, 9 SEC 393, even if I have filed the copy application after the period which has been prescribed for filing an appeal or an application has expired, the time spent for getting the copy must be excluded while computing the number of days delay. Please make a note of that. Next time when uh, the registry says, no, instead of 2000 days, it will be only less. Then you can always argue with the section with your uh, Supreme Court case. And uh, the next point which I would like to speak about is regarding the other extensions is where I have come across cases where suits are filed with a nominal court fee of rupees 50 or rupees 10 or declaration He knows that he has to make a payment of court fee of more than 2 lakhs or 3 lakhs. That will be there because for the court fee paragraph will clearly say what is the court fee he has to affix to the claim. But what he will do is he will purposely because uh, he wants to file uh, the suit within time, he will file it with a particular time. Uh, the nominal court fee. In fact, there have been cases where an appeal has been filed with a nominal court fee by the cause. You may get, uh, take time to get the approval from the uh, appropriate authority to file an appeal. So, in order to arrest the limitation, they always present an appeal memorandum with a nominal court fee. So, these matters have come up for consideration. See, prosecuting an appeal is another issue. But coming to a court, where I have to pay 1 lakh court fee, but I pay only 50 rupees and try to save limitation. And what invariably the court does, the court will take the claim, it will return it saying, pay a proper court fee, deficit court fee to be paid one month. So he will take back the papers, he will represent, he will take back, he will represent and ultimately one day he may pay and it may be even after two years. Notice will go to the defendant. The defendant will wonder how uh, the suit has been. So, some advocates 
are very, who are very clever and we always ask a trial lawyer whenever we receive any thing if we find feel that the suit may be barred by the limitation we always because we know that in 2009 he must have presented but the suit would have been numbered in 2013 so you know on 2013 suit how the suit is numbered then we always see the uh, the representation and the delay we have noted that there is a delay in payment of deficit court fee the defendant can immediately file an application to reject the payment saying that on the day when he filed the plain that there was no the proper court fee therefore there was no proper presentation in order 7 therefore the suit ought to be dismissed so he files an application for rejection so what normally what we were thinking was that okay if only 50 rupees only to that extent the claim will be saved for the remaining balance amount the suit is barred by limitation no the supreme court has now in 2012 7 ucc page 738 has said the suit will be treated as properly presented because under section 149 of cpc the court has power to grant extension of time but the power of court to grant extension of time to pay the court fee on the plane by the plaintiff cannot be exercised uh, without without uh, reference to what are the reasons for not uh, payment of court fee there have been cases where there has been a short supply of court fees there may be cases where the person would have died so the legal representative would not not have been able to come so if you are there's been justifiable reasons the court can grant extension of time matter of routine or a matter of right you cannot grant in this particular supreme court case what happened was he filed and he knew what is the amount he has to pay he takes back the return then he doesn't pay then there's a, after a few returns only he makes the payment the and the court as a matter of fact just allows him to take the make the payment and takes the file on the plaint on file the court held down saying no you cannot do that we may have a sweeping powers under 149 you can cure the defect but it can be only for a particular reason and it should be acceptable one and it should be a genuine one so you know, can you may take note of this so whenever any suit is filed with a delay you please go and see the plaint endorsement and find out whether there has been a proper payment of court fee on the date of institution of suit and whether there is an order condoning the delay with the reasons under section 149 for the payment of the deficit court fee if no such order is found on the face of the plane you are entitled to challenge the numbering of the taking on of the file of the plane by way of a revision to the court so please note be take note of that now uh, we have uh, i have uh, almost crossed all the relevant provisions which gives you an extension of the period of limitation so that we come within the prescribed period now coming to the schedule to the limitation act in fact it's very uh, neatly uh, arranged so it is uh, very interesting to say that whenever you get a client or when you want to file a suit when you want to know what is the nature of suit then you can similarly immediately go if it is going to be accounts article 1 to 5 contracts 6 to 55 so in the contracts what is the type of contract whether it is a partnership it's a sale of goods whatever it what a debt or it is going to be a bond all that comes under article 6 to 55 then suits relating to declarations it is covered by 56 to 58 decrees on instruments 59 60 immobile property 61 so we have all these suits which are being provided under 68 up to 120 now though the legislature has provided for various categories of suits there may be cases where we uh, have not have contemplated and all my civil rights under section 9 of cpc i have to come to the court so what will be the uh, limitation for a case which has not been provided for that is governed by the residuary article we call for the institution of suits is article 130 please make a note it is article 1 for filing of a suit next we have the proceedings for the appeals applications which are there under article 114 to 117 for various applications which can be filed is article 118 to 136 then we have a residuary clause for these applications 137 so 113 is for institution of suits 137 is for appeal and applications now from these articles i don't want to take each and every article and discuss them because it will be short of time so i have made a selection of a few articles which may be of relevance in your uh, normal practice and i am trying to give you the latest judgments on that the latest and the most famous is uh, the article 54 which is a suit for specific performance which has come for uh, uh, repeated consideration as to time is the essence of contract when the time starts running when is the three year period fixed uh, whether he has performed this part of the contract 
it's amazing to see a pattern of decisions on this and each time it will be weighed only on the basis of the facts it turns to the increment and we don't have a straight jacket formula fixing that this means three years this means with an unlimited in point of time so let us now read article 54 for a moment what does article 54 says for specific performance of a contract three years the date fixed for the performance or if no such date is fixed when the plaintiff has noticed that performance is refused now what do you mean by date fixed we normally what we do is in our agreement you shall pay the money on or before within three months from today six months from today one month from today one year from today that's how we always word the legislative agreements whether that will amount to a clause under the first part of article 54 came up for consideration in 2009 5 scc post the court said unless there is a specific date mentioned in the agreement that you shall perform on or before 5th july 2020 it should be mentioned otherwise it will not uh, come under the first clause you will straight away be governed by the second clause that is from the date of refusal or when you have come to know that there is a the performance has become due that to be governed by article 113 because that is a residuary article you don't have any other uh, uh, article for specific performance except article 54 suppose if it's not then performance is refused then the court said we look into article 113 and then we bring that into the frame so yes as notice of performance is refused. Now, there is going to be a subsequent registration of the very same property to a second defendant. Then registration is notice, pre-implied notice, you will, your period of limitation will start from three years. If suppose the, the defendant is, there is going to be, uh, uh, in fact, in 2023 SEC 289, there was a case where a particular uh, time limit was fixed for the performance. In the meantime, there was an acquisition proceeding and uh, the, both the vendor and the purchaser fought the government to get back the property from the government. The matter went up to the Supreme Court and the purchaser also went along with it. And the vendor specifically recorded, yes, I have sold the property to him, I put him in possession, I have received the money. This is how the matter went up to the uh, Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has quashed the proceedings. In the meantime, the vendor died. So the legal representative has to execute this sale deed. They did not execute this sale deed. So the purchaser has to come before the court and he filed a super specific performance. The court said his time will arise only when the legal representatives refused performance. Till then he was always in the good books of the vendor. So he never had been denied. Even though time was fixed under the contract, there was no denial by the, purchaser, the vendor to perform. Therefore, the time does not start to run. We have to see the conduct of the parties. If the parties have mutually, by way of an agreement or by implied terms, they have extended the time of the contract, then the first claim will become insignificant and we have to see only three years from the date of refusal or denial of the performance. Next, we will go to Articles 56 and 59, which speaks about the cancellation of instruments. In fact, there is a spate of uh, suits which are being filed left and right. One case will say, declare the document as null and void. Some will say it is not valid and binding on me. Some will say that maybe set aside. So the councils are at a loss to know whether I have to set aside a document or not. Whether it needs to be set aside before I ask for further relief. So those transactions are governed by Article 56 and 59. Now coming to Article 56, it speaks about a forgery of an instrument issued or registered. When the issue or registration comes to know to the plaintiff. Suppose somebody impersonates me or somebody has uh, signed my name and uh, forged my signature to prepare any document it has been registered. How will I know? I am not as a person owner. I have not done any act to sell the property. So I sit tight in my house. Or I may be even a non-resident who will be away from the vicinity of the property. When will my limitation will run? Only when I come to know about the registration or the act done by which the forgery has happened. So I will be entitled to three years to set aside the document because it is standing in my name. There have been cases where whether such an instrument needs to be set aside by a person when I am not a party to the document, when I have not signed the document. In fact, those also have come. That In fact, there are some case laws where it's not just Raghuraj also come to the question of court fees under section 40. 
So we have to understand what is a void document and a voidable transaction. The distinction you have to keep in mind. A voidable transaction uh, means where I am a party to it, but due to reasons under the various provisions of the contract act, like coercion, undue influence, cheating, all that, I am I'm a fraud. Because of that, the transaction is vitiated. If that be so, it becomes voidable. I need to set aside. Okay, I am not the direct uh, signatory to the document, but my father was a signatory to the document. Or my vendor was a signatory to the document. I am claiming under that uh, person and that person's document is set, uh, is what is challenged. Then I will have to set it aside. Because when I, whether the party to the document or the party claiming under the party to the document is always bound by the voidable transaction till it is set aside. But where is a void document? Where we plead non factum, Where we say there is an impersonation? Where we say that it is not my signature at all? In those day, cases, we don't need to set aside the document. We have to simply say, I am the owner of the property. This document is not binding on me because it is not my signature. Therefore, I need not set aside the document. So the voidable instruments has to be cancelled is specified in section 31 to 33 of the specific relief act. And the limitation is from the date of knowledge when it comes to your knowledge about when you have to avoid the transaction. And for which I have given the judgments in 2006, 5 SEC 353. In fact, in 2006, 5 SEC 353 is a case where the minor's property was dealt with by one of the persons and it was sold. So the question was whether he has to set aside the document within three years of attaining majority or he can file a suit for recovery of position within 20 years from the date of attaining majority. The court said it is an option given to the minor. He can either file a suit within three years or he can file a suit to recover position within 12 years of attaining majority. That is 2006 5 SEC page 353. In 2014 14 SEC 254, that was a case where a person filed a suit for declaration saying that the sale which he was executed by him was obtained by fraud and undue influence, coercion, and it was not his, uh, and he did not want to execute any sale deal. But he came to know about it by way of certain exchange, by way of criminal complaints before the other forums, before the criminal court. But he slept over his right and he knocked at the doors of the court after more than 12 years from the date of the transaction. The court said, Supreme Court says, your, your remedy is barred, you should immediately come to the court. And I leave 1990 also is on similar issue. I don't want to trouble about that. Then coming to the residuary article. I was speaking article 113 is for filing of suits, which is not already provided under the remaining articles 1 to 112. So what type of uh, uh, suits can be contemplated under that? Just giving you three examples of what are the other suits not provided for, for which 113 has been invoked, is what this my endeavor here in this particular note. You can see that 2018, 12 SEC, page 393, is for an, uh, additional works and escalation charges claimed by a contractor. For me, there is no specific uh, article which gives him a period of limitation. So when he becomes entitled for the uh, the cost of the additional works and escalation charges is explained in 2018 12 SEC, saying that he will be entitled to three years on the day when he is, makes the claim for additional works and today it is being rejected by the uh, uh, principal. Next is regarding 1991 4 SEC page 1, where a service person in a service matter, now we have CAD, TAN, which are all governed by the state and central government property. But in case of private contracts of employment, Challenging an order of dismissal or termination will be governed by Section 9 CPC and the, that can be done within three years from the date of dismissal or termination and that is maintained under the and that provision of Article 113 is what will apply to such type of cases. Now 113 will also apply in case there is a counterclaim by way of a defendant because it is always treated as a suit. So to know whether articles will apply even in case of counterclaim which will be treated as an independent suit, you can rely on 1987. 3 SEC, page 265. Now, what is uh, the Limitation Act does? What is the scope of the Limitation Act? We have to come to the court within a particular time frame. Okay, I come. If I don't come, what will happen? I have given uh, 2 lakhs to my friend. He has not paid. Thinking that uh, he will make the payment, I just wait at home. He never comes. 
and by the time i realized that he is not going to pay there's no acknowledgement in writing so i am not able to go to the court will that uh, liability to pay gets uh, uh, ex extinguished no the liability to pay continues there is only one section which speaks about extinguishment of right otherwise all other rights are not barred it is only you are prevented from getting justice in a court of law suppose i have to get the money back we accept going to court if i am capable of getting it outside the court i can it doesn't extinguish that right extinguish my right to recover i can give a criminal complaint i can give a i can go before some other uh, third person and try to uh, get my money so it, it's not barred it will never become barred. my remedy to through a court of law is alone barred but my right to get back my money is never extinguished why they thought in 1963 is ஒரு மனுஷனும் வந்து கடங்காரனா சாக மாட்டான் நினைக்கிறேன் if i am not transferring it by a registered document the third person will never get the owner of the property especially if it is more than 100 rupees registration or whatever formality i have to form only if it is registered the property will be vested in the third party whereas by this particular section 27 it says if the person who is entitled to an immovable property has to approach a court of law within certain period of limitation prescribed under the act and he fails to do it then he loses his right in the property in fact very uh, interesting extinguishment of right to property at the determination of the period hereby limited to any person for instituting a suit for possession of any property his right to such property shall be extinguished but when it comes to all other movables it is not mentioned only for an immovable property it says so we have to be very careful when we are when we want to have a property and it is going to be a very uh, important issue that you should go and knock at the doors of the court within a time limited otherwise you are going to lose your property therefore the question in the case was whether there was an adverse possession so if i go and knock at the door and the defendant pleads an adverse possession the court has always dismissed my suit saying he is an adverse possession and all along we have been saying adverse possession is only a defense it is not a shield i can only plead in defense but i cannot assert by way of a right by way of a separate suit but that has been now changed a new law is now developed in 2019 8acc 729 the courts have now recognized that in view of section 27 of the limitation act once i have perfected title by adverse possession and i get acquire a prescriptive right i am entitled to maintain a suit on that ground and say that i am entitled to the property i can even seek for a declaration of title on that basis now uh, regarding the right to approach the court article 65 will apply for all suits for declaration of title that is 12 years from the date when you become entitled to the property or when you know that your right is desired, denied especially if i am without possession 12 years if i am in possession i can ask for injunction i need not go and uh, sue for mere declaration of title before any court of law but suppose i am in possession of the property and i come to know that one third person claiming title has asserted a uh, uh, right in the property and executed registered documents and there been further i come i i never know about it because i have never gone to the registrar office but later when i come to know that there are various encumbrances without uh, which is disturbing my right then the law provides a relief under the specific fact to approach the court of law to declare that those documents are invalid and not binding on me otherwise you are the, you will not be in a position to sell the property so you need not pay court fee for your value of the property but if that those documents are not executed by you but if allowed to be remaining in the registrar of assurances you are going your your right title will be affected you can always move the court and file now with this no limitation at all and one other interesting point here is this 2014 9 scc 185 in fact there has been divergent opinion on that particular issue regarding time limit for redemption and more specifically with reference to usable pre mortgages 
you all must be knowing about simple mortgages useful free mortgages which are more prevalent now and simple mortgages in the city of madras are given an additional right to uh, sell it by way of a private auction the section 69 of tp act now let us forget about all that now as a mortgage or i have to redeem my property my right of redemption under article 61 of the uh, uh, limitation act gets extinguished upon the expiry of a period of 30 years either to redeem or to recover possession of the property so a mortgage is given 30 years limitation whereas a mortgage when the amount becomes due he has to sue for his money within 12 years if he doesn't do it then he loses his right to recover the money under the mortgage so he loses the security and he loses the mortgage so this is article 62 one in case of usurper free mortgages where possession is handed over to the mortgage how will we compute uh, how will we compute limitation was issue one view was when no time is mentioned normally in usurper free mortgages how we write is today i have handed over possession to you i will pay the money at the principal amount after 10 years until the 10 years you enjoy the rents and profits and adjust it towards the uh, interest and principal at the expiry of the 10 years i'll take back the property this is how one type of use of property mortgages are some will say for 10 years you will enjoy only the rents towards the interest and upon the expiry of the period of 10 years i'll pay the principal and on payment of the principal you will hand over the uh, property to me and discharge the mortgage this is another type so the question arose when no time limit is mentioned and the mortgage is allowed to enjoy the property without any time limitation what will be the period of limitation for the mortgage to redeem or recover possession of the property from the mortgage because there have been cases from trivandrum from uh, southern districts like uh, kanyakumari that place and Well, even 1924, 1930s, a more usable free mortgage would have been created, and the parties would not have uh, redeemed the mortgage. Neither the mortgage he would have uh, exercised his right of uh, recovery of the money or issued any notice. The people would have enjoyed the property continuously for generation to come for nearly 30, 60 years, and ultimately one day the mortgagee's uh, family will file a suit for uh, redemption. The question was, what was the period of limitation? so the question was answered here by saying one one new was from the day when no time is fixed under the mortgage under the mortgage the amount becomes due even on the date of mortgage so 30 years from the date of mortgage you have to file a suit that was the one view there was another view which said when no time limit is fixed till such time the mortgage amount is discharged and the rents and the profits are adjusted towards the principal the time limit of limitation for redemption does not start now the second view has been accepted in 2014 9 scc page 185 where the supreme court says the right of a usurper mortgage or to recover possession and redeem and redeem the property will arise only upon the entire payment of the consideration of the principal and the interest and that has to be uh, by way of a demand by the uh, use of the mortgage the mortgagee as far as the use of the mortgagee is concerned he has got no remedy in law to come to court because he is in possession he has to enjoy the property he has not been given any right of foreclosure or sale by approaching the court he has to sit tight now in one of the cases what happened was the redemption suit was filed by the mortgagor and the court uh, granted a prelim decree for redemption and uh, he has to make a payment within a particular time frame but he did not exercise that option and no final decree was also passed in that suit so he files an application for extension of time to make the deposit an amount is deposited and then the suit was uh, closed as uh, fully satisfied that was challenged by the defendant uh, mortgagee saying he has lost his right to redeem the property the court has uh, fixed him a particular time frame he has not uh, redeemed the mortgage therefore the entire uh, thing is lost the court said as far as the mortgagee the mortgage are is concerned till such time by a decree of court or by an understanding between the parties the right in the mortgage is extinguished the right of redemption will never be lost to a party therefore article 61 will apply only to all other mortgages except usurper free mortgage as far as the mortgage are concerned please make a note of this and it will be an interesting reading about the conflict of judgments which is referred in 2014 9 acc page 185
and uh, last but not the least i think this is the last uh, slide i have the last one will be thank you and uh, what i would like to uh, highlight here is 2015 by acc 674 see in fact uh, we all file applications under order 7211 to reject the plane when on the face of the plane we know that the suit is barred by limitation then issues have come under specific performance suit that when whether the first clause applies or second clause applies so the court said it becomes a big question of law i don't want to decide it under the preliminary issue so whenever the question of fact or the limitation comes it is becoming a big question of law because there is an acknowledgement there is a conduct of parties exchange of correspondences between the parties how they have behaved to each other so many things will turn on evidence the court doesn't want to decide this limitation as a preliminary issue and it is cautioned against being decided as a preliminary issue but there have been some cases where the courts have dismissed the invoke order 7 to 11 but it is very rare next we have uh, 2019 40 ecc 449 which i would like to draw your attention that i file initially a suit after prosecuting it for about 4 uh, or 5 years i feel that uh, i cannot proceed i need uh, uh, the just be withdrawn for some defect and all that therefore i file an application under order 23 rule 3 to withdraw the suit and the court also gives me a liberty to file a fresh suit on the same cause of action whether in those cases whether i'll be entitled to uh, exclude the period uh, which i have spent in the earlier litigation under 14 the court says no you cannot exclude the time for what you have spent which the suit which you have withdrawn and you have been allowed to file the then the second suit will be only a fresh suit and if it is beyond the period of limitation it has to be dismissed so the withdrawal of suit non prosecution all that will not give you an extended period of limitation and that cannot be excluded under the section 14 also for what whatever reason and 2007 9 acc 641 is what i have already informed to you in the earlier uh, when i was discussing that the defendant should be agile he should not be falling a prey to the plaintiff's maneuvers of filing of stupid suits he must be very cautious about guarding his right and if he has any right to be exercised it has to be done without waiting for the plaintiff's suit to be disposed of on merits whatever may be the reason because he will never get an extended period of limitation and it's not contemplated under the law and it's a big thank you i am open for questions and answers thank you so much members can use the raise hand option for raising any queries so that shivan mugam will unmute you good evening madam yes good evening uh, very very nice presentation madam thank you uh, the instant case madam there is a central government employee drawing pension few years ago he was in the service mm. and now he is drawing pension but his uh, pr further promotion was denied mm. hello Ah, yeah, tell me, sir. Uh, after uh, four years, he he filed a uh, voice in uh, tribunal. Mm. It it was admitted, mm. but after four long years, it was uh, dismissed on the ground of limitation. Mm. Is it correct, madam? I say, sir, the limitation will not apply to the uh, tribunals, no. Yeah, that's what. But even then, it was dismissed on limit. Dismissed on the ground of delay, acquiescence, latches. Yeah, but it was admitted initially. Okay. Whether you have to they, see whether the Limitation Act will apply under the labor laws, labor law. Under which act he has applied? Whether uh, he raised any industrial dispute or whether he is generally a workman? There are so many other laws. Central so government employee, madam. Yeah, central government employee. That's what I am saying. And drawing pension. Hmm. So he has to come, for promotion. Uh, he cannot come at this hour. No, it will be only on the ground of delay and latches. The question of limitation yeah. will not arise. Yeah, for the purpose of uh, drawal of higher pension, hmm. he uh, asks for. Uh, he cannot. He cannot. Because it will be only on the ground of delay and latches. In the Limitation Act, I don't think will apply for that. Is it correct? Because only for a suit. If he has filed a suit, it is okay. But in central government employees, they are governed by their own service rules. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, the point is the only point. according to that, not according to the limitation act. No, madam. The point is whether the cat can dismiss this on on the basis of limitation. That is my question. 
you see the services rules which says whether he is entitled to and whether the limitation act will apply you have to see there as i said 292 unless it is specifically excluded we can read into it okay madam thank you yeah that's a question in the chat box. Is there any limitation in for filing a partition suit? No limitation. Why you know? I'm entitled to the property. And there's no if there is a dispute between me and another person and he denies my right to the property, then the limitation will start running. I can file any number of suits for partition, allow me to go for dismiss for default, and then again come back and file. Because once I go to the court asking that I'm unable to divide my property, it is the duty of the court to divide and give it to me. And uh, therefore, you know, every day is a cause of action, and every day is a, well, it is a continuous cause of action. So, for, uh, there's no limitation for partition. It's not provided under the Act also. That's another question, madam, from Mr. Mahesh. Uh, he asks me whether Article 113 applicable to setting as an ex parte orders. 113 will apply to ex parte orders. Ex parte orders, no, it's already provided in the CPC, no? With the section 5. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I asked. No, 113 he, applicable for setting as an ex parte order. No, no. So ex parte orders under in the suits under Order 9, Rule 13, that is separate. Okay. Where there you, you file certain applications under certain statutes and we come before the court, then it will be governed by 130. 130, 130. 113 is applied only for suits. Please don't confuse it with the applications and appeals and the interlocutory orders. It will have no application for uh, interlocutory orders. 113 will apply only for the interlocutory of for new suit, which is not specifically provided in the earlier provisions under 1200. Good evening, madam. Good evening. Uh, madam, my question is I am a private sector employee. Huh? Uh, I have been, I am a private sector, private sector bank employee. Okay. Un unlawfully terminated. Mm. And the petition is filed before, uh, red petition filed before High Court. Mm. Now, so assume that I am lost the uh, red petition. Whether I can go back to the city civil court for reinstatement, madam? If your red petition is dismissed on the ground of not maintainability because they, what whom you are agitating is not the state, therefore it is not maintainable, 226 is not maintainable, then you can exclude the period of limitation to go before the court. See, even before the civil court, what you can do is you can only ask for damages. You will not be entitled to reinstatement. Yeah, correct, madam. Yes, madam. Ah, I agree, I agree. Yes. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Two other questions. Uh, what is the reason for exclusion of application of section 5 to execution proceedings? Uh, execution proceedings, sir. Yes. In fact, there is one uh, judgment of his Russian, this is Ram Subramaniam, where uh, there is a Madras amendment to Order 21, Rule 106. See, CPC, the Limitation Act specifically says because why they brought in section 5 is not applicable to our execution is they want to bring a quietus to the litigation. With all the this, uh, you get a judgment and decree. And at the execution stage, it gets stalled. And if you still give extended time, there's not going to be an end to litigation. The fruits of the decree will never be enjoyed by the decree holder. That's why they said section 5 will not apply. But in spite of that, prior to 1963 itself, there was uh, an amendment to uh, 21106 by way of a Madras amendment, where they said Section 5 will be applicable to 106. That came up for consideration by his lots of this is Ram Subramani MJ. Right now, I don't have the judgment. It's specifically, you can see also, you'll, you'll find it, where he has said that the present uh, 1963 Act cannot do away with the Madras amendment to CPC under 21106, and Section 5 will apply to 21106 as the judgment of our Madras High Court. Please see, that has opened a Pandora's box I don't know, 21, 98, 89, all those applications within 60 days and 90 days will come up with innumerable day delay. Uh, I have my own uh, reservations about the judgment. <laughs> <laughs> That's another question in the, uh, in the nature of consultation asked by one Rani Alio. Power of attorney was given to a person uh, to close a debt. Person who received it uh, is dead within a week. Is there any remedy? If so, any limitation applies? Kindly explain now. No, I don't understand what he's saying. Power of attorney was given to a person to close a debt. To close a debt of whom? 
who is uh, who is dead now it's priti <laughs> who is dead whether the paravadani is dead or the person who has to pay the money is dead that is not clear uh, sir uh, nice presentation ma'am thank you thank you, thank you. regarding that uh, criminal limitation i want some points madam hmm criminal acts eh? criminal act to... vandu illa illa limitation act la vandu criminal appeals ku mattum da provide pannirukanga okay madam limitation in respect of criminal cases vandu you have to go to crpc yes madam inge vandu you have only provision for appeals yes, adha criminal limitation act la provide pannirukanga adanal adha adha na choice na utturren okay okay that's why i'm asking <laughs> thank you it's outside the scope of my case today <laughs> okay thank you much mr venkatesan you are unmuted you can do. okay good evening madam yes good evening uh, very uh, nice class madam thank you uh, madam adavadhu or civil suit la madam first vandu dana settlement mudinjirudhu madam adha base panni degree vaangiranga adukku munnadiye vandu or dana settlement எழுதி வச்சிருக்காரு அந்த தான செட்டில்மெண்ட் வந்து இப்போ நம்ம இன்வோல் பண்றதுக்கு ஏதாவது டைம் பி இது இருக்குங்களா மேடம் டைம் லிமிடேஷன் அது எப்படி நீங்க ஈஸி ஈஸிலாம் பாக்கமே எப்படி சூட் போடுவீங்க இல்ல ஃபர்ஸ்ட் தான செட்டில்மெண்ட் கொடுத்தாரு அப்பா வந்து மகளுக்கு சரி அந்த தான செட்டில் மேல என்ன பண்ணா மகள் போட்டு டிக்ளரேஷன் வாங்குறாங்க சரி இவர் அதுக்கு முன்னாடியே ஒரு தான செட்டில்மெண்ட் மருமக மேல எழுதி வச்சிருக்காரு அது இப்போதான் கிடைக்குது அது தேர்ன பின்னாடி இப்போதான் கிடைக்குது அது ஆ சரி இப்ப இந்த தான செட்டில்மெண்ட் வச்சு இவங்க ஏதாவது ரிலீஃப் கேட்க முடியுமா மேடம் எனக்கு அந்த ஜட்ஜ் அதுல அவங்க பார்க்கியா அதுல அவங்க பார்த்த இல்ல இல்ல இப்ப நீங்க வந்து மக பேர்ல வாங்கி இருக்காங்கல அது பார்க்கியா அவங்க மருமக இல்ல இல்ல அது அது பார்த்த இல்ல பார்த்த இல்ல இல்ல அப்ப எப்படி அவங்க கட்டுப்படுத்தோ அவங்க போடலாம் மருமக தனியா கேஸ் போட்டு இவங்க ரெண்டு பேரும் கொலுசுவா வாங்கி இருக்காங்க இத انا கட்டுப்படுத்தாது அப்படி போடலாம் அப்ப இந்த ஜட்ஜ்மென்ட் கேன்சல் பண்ண சொல்லி கேட்க முடியுமா மேடம் கேன்சலே பண்ண வேண்டாம் நீங்க அது இல்ல கட்டுப்படுத்தாதுன்னு சொல்ல வேண்டாம் இல்ல நீங்க கேன்சல் இல்ல பார்த்த இல்ல பாத்தீங்க கேடையமா மேடம் அது டைம் லிமிட்டட் நமக்கு எதுவும் கேடையத தான மேடம் அதான் மேடம் உங்களுக்கு தெரிஞ்சதுலயே நீங்க உங்க பொறுத்தவரைக்கும் அது கட்டுப்படுத்தறதுனால நீங்க எப்பவும் தான் போலாம் டைம் லிமிட்டேஷன் டைம் லிமிட் ஓகே थैंक यू थैंक यू மேடம் அப்புறம் தேர் இஸ் ஒன் क्वेश्चन வெதர் லிமிட்டேஷன் ஆக்ட் பாண்டிச்சேரி அதாவது முன்னாடி வந்து ஆர்டிகல் 2262 ஆஃப் தி புதுச்சேரி கோட் வந்து இதே வர சேயிங் தட் தே ரெண்டாயிரத்து 30 இயர்ஸ் ஆஃப் லிமிடேஷன் அப்படி இல்ல இருந்தது அப்புறம் தட் இஸ் பீன் गिवन அ குவைட் அஸ் அதோ வந்து இதே ராம் சுவாலியோ வேற யாரோ தான் நம்ம பெஞ்ச்ல உட்கார்ந்து 30 இயர்ஸ் இதெல்லாம் கிடையாது 1963 லே ஆக்ட் இஸ் பீன் இன்ஆக்டட் அண்ட் இட் இஸ் பீன் எக்ஸ்டெண்டட் அண்ட் எக்ஸ்டென்ஷன் ஆஃப் லாஸ் ஆக்ட் இஸ் ஒன் சீரி பிஃபோர் யூ பாண்டிச்சேரிக்கு வந்து லிமிடேஷன் ஆக்ட் ஃபீல் அப்ளை 2030 10 ACC page 470 thank you ma'am 2013 10 ssc 470 yes i one, got the answer for the question <laughs> one more question is limitation act applies to government order ha huh? limitation act applies to government order government order ha jo jo chapter one any right any right which affect to any any cause of action which affect your interests then your right to sue appears so as far as writ petition is concerned there's no limitation so any jo you are going to question only on the ground of uh, 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 226 so that will be governed by the legislature there's no limitation for writ petition last question probably whether limitation act applicable for probating a will no ஆர்டிகல் 137 மின்றான ஒரே சண்டை நடந்துது வாருங்க அதுக்கு ஆன்சர் சொல்லுங்க 2018 1ACC அது இருக்கு அதுல அவங்களோட அந்த இதுல 2018 1ACC 271 அப்ளிகேஷன் ஃபார் ரிவோகேஷன் ஆஃப் ப்ரோபேட்க்கு அப்ளை ஆகும் 137 பட் இட் will not apply for grant of probate why they say is when why i actually in the appa we are in charge na enak vandu irukku but i would like to want to seal up the court adukku na eppa vena poi vaangikalam so there is a case where when you are already aware that the bill has been denied and you are proceeding the going on in a separate suit for partition adu appeal mudinji tenant illa varum bodhu probate court ku poiduvanga appo vandu the court said it's a bit of delay and latches on that so in dismissing the probate proceeding otherwise on the ground of limitation you cannot uh, dismiss an application for probate thank you madam thank you very much welcome i finally invite mr r murli advocate give a vote of thanks for this wonderful session good evening senior yes friends 
and all the participants of our study circle meet this may be one of the formal vote of thanks but today session is not such that definitely it is not such a formal meeting this is a wonderful session rendered by our senior mrs sitra sambhat madam thank you so much madam for thank your you. wonderful session and today evening is the one of the great resource to our judiciary thank you so much ma'am thank you thank you thank you very much madam thanks for your time thank i you. think today's members have been enlightened to the matter mass for the limitation act is concerned thank you so much. thank you so it cannot be exhaustive anyway we tried our best thank you ma'am